good afternoon and welcome to uh, Think Tech's uh, Perspectives on Energy here at Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Guillermo Sabatier, I'm Director of International Services for the Health and Safety Institute. And uh, today's show is uh, HALU, uh, the high assay, low enrichment uranium. And we're going to talk about a few of those questions, given the fact that uh, it's a new type of nuclear fuel that's going to be used for uh, those small modular reactors. So um, thank you again for joining us, and hopefully we'll get some questions answered. Um, mind you, uh, on this slide, it's all uh, public domain information and available from the Department of Energy, their Office of Nuclear Energy, and also from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So uh, without further ado, let's jump right into this presentation and see what uh, what we can we can convey regarding this new uh, fuel, HALU. HALU. Go ahead and go to the first slide. There you go. Thank you. So on this uh, particular um, type of fuel, we're looking at it's new different fuels, right? So the ones, the agency that governs uh, the regulation of nuclear energy is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and they are operating under the auspices of the Department of Energy, right? So it's an independent agency that oversees the civilian use of nuclear materials, right? Uh, in my time was working in a nuclear plant, I can recall that you know a lot of the documentation, a lot of the sign off, and a lot of the oversight was done by the NRC, right? Now, uh, what's going on in this case, right? So, and I'm following this this um, the second block from the right, and it looks like we're why is this so important now, right? I mean, nuclear has been around for a long time. This agency, this commission, has been around for a long time. So the, the purpose really is the fact that they're stepping up their efforts to um, bring about this new type of fuel that is a um, standardized. Uh, one of the problems with deploying these SMRs is the fact that nobody has agreed on an overall design, nobody has agreed on an overall fuel type. And of course, with supply chain and something so expensive, you can, you can imagine that that becomes a barrier to entry. So in this case, agreeing to a type of fuel on these SMRs is is a good, great first step. And one of the previous shows, we talked about the fact that they already had a first test bed for a particular SMR reactor that they were already using at the Idaho National Labs and National Renewable Energy Laboratories. So they're, they at least have got that going already. So now the next step is basically to be the widely accepted use of Haley, right? Um, so now what they're doing is they're using their existing regulatory framework to now include this new type of fuel, right? So uh, according to their tools, right, they have already, when it comes to regulation, they wanna make sure they have adequate protection, which is licensing. They wanna make sure they have adequate oversight that ensures compliance, but they also wanna make sure they continue with the supporting uh, development of technical base, right? So in other words, a lot of the funding that we've seen from the Department of Energy and also uh, uh, the NRC has gone towards uh, these, these labs where they're, they're developing these reactors to move along this technology. Uh, as you can imagine, right, we, we have some catching up to do with the rest of the world a little bit. And given the fact that we wanna make sure we get to these climate goals with the generation of energy, uh, this seems to be like a pretty, pretty, pretty substantial and uh, reliable type of uh, resource, right? Uh, as we get away from fossil fuels and we, but we still need base load that's dispatchable. This could be the answer, right? Um, one of the things we're doing as well, of course, is uh, engaging in uh, international partnerships. And uh, we'll get more into that later. Uh, usually that involves part of the supply chain, part of the uh, fuel uh, refining. But then uh, of course also uh, the next thing that's important is, uh, is rulemaking, right? Which now this may require, I mean, it's very minimal, may require some different types of rules when it comes to safety, right? So best thing is, is right now the existing tools can accommodate the new fuels. And that is great news because that'll of course um, expedite and simplify this process, right? So, um, so when they say non-light water reactor fuels, right? You're concerned with the enrichment process, transportation, fabrication of the fuel, fresh fuel transport, uh, putting that into the reactor, and then of course getting rid of the waste that, once that happens, which is the irradiated fuel transportation, and then storing it somewhere. In some cases, some of that fuel can be used or recycled for a new fuel, but that's a whole other process, right? So um, when looking at fuel activities, right? Like I said earlier, right? So enrichment, fabrication, materials, and spent fuel, that is the general process that uh, 
the NRC is looking at when it comes to developing new fuels. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So what is uh, HALU? It's high assay, low enrichment uranium, right? And what we see here, right, for example, uh, the, the, the HALU, which falls uh, in this category, is between 5 and 20% enrichment, you know, the U-235. Uh, naturally occurring uranium is less than 1%. It's usually about 0.7% um, per mass. So that is the, uh, the level of uranium. When it comes to enrichment, right, uh, existing reactors, are usually less than, uh, is this, they use about, that's a, the low enriched uranium, usually about less than 20%. HALU is kind of like the U-235. Those, those, those are the advanced reactors and nuclear thermal propulsion rockets. Those are anywhere between 5 and 19.75. So they already form a proportion of those like low enriched uranium reactors. Now, something that's more than 20%, those are the highly enriched uranium uh, fuel that's usually part of naval reactors. Usually, you, you know, what you find in nuclear subs and nuclear aircraft carriers, or 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 any kind of like uh, naval vessels. That's usually slightly more enriched, and that of course is like a longer life with a higher burn rate. So a lot of a lot of cases that that spent fuel usually has enough uranium that's unburned that can still be refined and um, used to create halo at that point. So we'll get into more of that later. So what's the purpose of all this? What, what, what's the benefit with this new fuel? Well, uh, part of it involves uh, being able to utilize smaller designs. Again, the SMRs, right, which is really what the goal we're looking at. Uh, the other interesting thing here is that it also, um, the core of these devices, it, it extends our useful life, right, part of that. And then another one is, of course, increasing fuel efficiency. So. Uh, with higher enrichment that's higher than typical uh, lower rich uranium, but lower than the naval reactors. Of course, enriching enriching uranium takes a long time. It's very resource heavy. So this is kind of like the nice little um, in-between sweet spot that we can use for this size of reactor, right? And of course, ultimately, it's a lot less waste in this case. And uh, so again, part of that is um, usually involves uh, we have a process, whether it's chemical, which is recycling government-owned HEU, which is the highly enriched uranium coming from naval reactors, and then we convert that to HALU. That's one process. The other one is actually like scratch from the bottom enrichment. That requires the use of typical gas centrifuges to separate uranium isotopes by weight to produce a higher percentage of U-235 in the uranium. Uh, each has their advantages and disadvantages, and of course, each varies in cost. Uh, and uh, the other issue is that you're not going, going to have a lot of HEU, HEU available to convert that to HEU at some point. And uh, not to mention the fact that a lot of the fuel that we were using everywhere was coming from the uh, from Russia. And during this whole conflict that began with the Ukraine, of course, that that access to that supply has dwindled. So then again, we have that we have that problem to contend with as well. So yeah, that's also spurred on. The desire to create our own uh, high SA low enrichment uranium fuels for our new reactors. Next slide, please. So here we go with the question. So general HALU question, right? So what is HALU? I think we covered that a little bit before. It's the high high SA low enrichment uranium. Uh, so enriched at the concentration of the fissile isotope uranium two thirty five or U two thirty five is between five and twenty percent, right? So in this case. Uh, and we talked about earlier, the, it's the natural uranium is less than 1% of U-235. Typical reactors between 3 and 5, U-235 with the uranium enriched of 20% or greater, of course, is usually highly enriched, U, and that's usually used in uh, ships, right? Uh, usually nuclear, nuclear vessels. Um, so fuels that use HALU are also referred to as HALU-containing fuel. Now, mind you, everything I'm reading here uh, that, that I'm reporting, I'm kind of adding my own little summary of it, is available on the website that I that's pulls at the bottom of this link. So, again, all of this is like uh, public domain. It's available, and you can research it for yourselves. I'm just going to summarize it for all of you. Right? So the next question is, what is HALU used for? Right. So we're talking about the different types. We went over that. But... Um, Again, the whole purpose of this really is to apply that in advanced nuclear reactors. And then a lot of those are going to be the SMRs and maybe even the micro reactors, right? So uh, traditionally, these HALUs uh, fuels were actually used for uh, producing isotopes for medical use. So uh, this definitely already has a commercial application. It just hasn't been for, for like uh, generating power, right? Uh, 
Um, the other thing is some operating research and test reactors already use halo containing fuel. So, uh, and, and again, the, one of them was, uh, the, we talked about in one of the previous episodes, discussed that when it came to, uh, it was uh, NRL or, I, or Idaho National Labs that they, they already had one launched. Uh, the thing, remember, is developers have proposed using HALU and fuel for molten salt reactors or in the trisol fuel, right, which is another type of, the, of, uh, of uh, rods that they're using in some of these reactors. So the use of such a fuel may allow for smaller designs that produce more power per unit of volume. So also developers expect the HALU would allow their system to be optimized for smaller reactor cores, longer core lines, and we talked about all this earlier, right? So again, the whole point here is that it'll reduce operating costs, make uh, the barrier of entry a lot lower. Uh, more importantly, you can have a lot of these like uh, smaller sites installed everywhere and they'll be secured and uh, won't require personnel to be at the site. It'll just be something that's uh, that's secure remotely and accessible, and perhaps even buried deep in the remote communities. So that'll be definitely helpful. And of course, we'll get far better use of that fuel as opposed to conventional nuclear reactors, which are usually deployed at a very high scale, right? Now, the next question is, who makes HALU? So right now in the US, we got two different companies that have the NRC licenses and uh, to, to do this. And now one of them on their license is Centrist Energy. And they make about 600 kilograms of HALU of uranium. Uh, they can't, that's their capacity at this point. And they can enrich that under night up to 19.75% enrichment, right? And of course, uh, and also the Louisiana Energy Services, they produce HALU with a 235 enriched up to 5.5%. So you got the 5.5% enrichment, and then you got the 19.75% enrichment. So Centris Energy and Louisiana Energy Services. So those are the ones that, uh, that, that have the uh, current licensing to develop this fuel. Now, how is HALU produced, right? Um, there are two ways that we talked about earlier. You can either uh, refine it from, from scratch or you can go ahead and uh, recycle the spent uh, AU fuel, which is high enrichment fuel, which comes out of like uh, uh, naval applications. So those are the different types that you can actually use that. And of course, it's under, uh, it's down blending uranium of greater 235 concentration to lower enriched material. Right? So for example, Centris and Louisiana Energy Services are licensed by NRC to produce HALU using gas centrifuges. The U.S. Department of Energy plans to downblend high enriched uranium hue. That's the, that's the, uh, the, the naval stuff with current lower enriched uranium to produce HALU. So, so the commercial applications are, are, are going to refine it, whereas the DOE is going to downblend it using the naval, the naval materials, right? So as a publication, is HALU using existing commercial reactors? No, not right now. There is a test reactor currently, as I talked about earlier, but right now those uh, those R and D reactors are the ones that are currently using that. Now, of course, we don't know what's happening in military installations. I'm not going to speculate, but um, usually those are way ahead of what these uh, test reactors are doing in some of these places. So, but I'm not going to speculate. Next slide, please. So, who licenses Haley? Of course, we talked about that earlier. It's the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and that, and they also uh, they license the commercial production, the use, the storage, transportation, and also the uh, the waste waste handling, right, for that fuel. And then, of course, the DOE can perform down blending, of course, in government government owned uranium and its facilities under its own authority. So inevitably, the government here uh, had to step in and get involved because of the the scale, the price, the cost. Of developing this along with the development of a uh, reactor, a unified design that or standardized design that everybody can get behind and build. Again, we're facing issues with uh, supply chain management and uh, in, in this global supply chain that becomes a challenge when it comes to making these things more affordable and uh, cost effective to do. Okay, next one. Is the NRC prepared to license HALU? And their answer is yes. The NRC is leveraging the A. So they have their current uh, experience and their current infrastructure and their current uh, uh, procedural process structure to be able to manage this, uh, th this new type of fuel. So for them, that should not be an issue. Uh, the interesting thing as well is that they will be, of course, um, highly engaged in the R&D process of this. 
but they're definitely ready to license this particular type of fuel. Next question, has the NRC reviewed any HALU-related licensing applications? The, and the answer is, of course, uh, the NRC has reviewed HALU-related licensing, yes. Uh, they've issued a certificate of compliance, I'm sorry, certificate of compliance for a transportation package that can transport tristructural, so tristructural fuel, tristructural isotropic particle fuel that includes uranium and enriched to higher than 5% uranium, right? So, so yes, they and they awarded that to, they also awarded that to uh, to Centris Energy, which will produce a halo in which is 19.75. Okay, so that's already going on the way. Uh, the next uh, next slide, please. I think we're going to a halo safety question. All right. So um, how will the NRC know if halo and halo containing fuel is safe? And they're doing it by the same process that they've done with other fuels in the past, right? They have, they already have existing, the NRC already has existing regulations containing Title 10 of the Code of Federal Regulations to provide reasonable assurance of adequate protection of public health and safety, right? So, so yes, they, they have undergone their existing procedures to be able to, to declare this as, as safe as, as any other nuclear fuel has been declared safe in the past, right? So that the answer is yes. My next question is, is the NRC actively engaging stakeholders regarding HALU? Uh, according to the NRC's answer, is like, yes, the NRC is actively engaging with a broad range of stakeholders to better prepare to review future applications related to commercial HALU use, right? So, the, yes, they've engaged the DOE, they've engaged uh, international partners, and they've engaged, of course, they're engaged with different labs, right? Idaho National Labs, NRL, and then a few others, right, to be able to actually work on this. Uh, they also, NRC also took, takes part in meetings with stakeholders to understand the industry's near and long-term plans uh, on, for the HALU use in non-light water reactors. So, so again, a lot of this is available in the uh, NRC website. Uh, important thing to note here, right, is that this is going to take, in order to meet our climate goals and in order to have a reliable grid, right, we just can't rely on solar and battery and wind uh, and but, but at the same time, we have to get away, transition away from some of these fossil fuels. And right now, the only um, yeah, the only good option right now seems to be uh, uh, nuclear. But again, it's the scale of, which is what makes it really, really uh, challenging in this case. Right. All right. Next slide, please. Okay. So, halo research, implementation, and application questions. So. First question here is, does the NRC have to make any changes to the regulations to allow licensees to use HALU, right? And uh, they, but basically they say that no, they determined that it is sufficient to review applications to an appropriate license to save use of HALU for concepts and designs that are currently anticipated. Further, as with any new tech being submitted to the NRC for review, the NRC is prepared to establish new and or refine existing regulatory requirements in a timely manner if constant specific heavy features warranted. So uh, do they have to make any changes? They say they don't anticipate any, but if they, they needed to, they're ready to do that. So in that case, that's kind of the, the best answer they have. So, so um, they may need to make some changes regarding the fact that this is a new kind of fuel with a new kind of reactor. But at the same time, they have a lot of existing infrastructure when it comes to managing this sort of and uh, procedural process, uh, procedural uh, documentation to handle this kind of fuel. Right? Next question is: How does the NRC assess when when to conduct potential research related to HALU and HALU containing fuel? So they're already doing that as it is, right? Uh, so the NRC staff is practically assessing anticipated needs and pursuing research, research activities to ensure the staff is ready to effectively review license applications, right? So they're already engaging that. And from we saw in our last uh, document, uh, last uh, episode, I think we, we talked about how they now have like uh, commissioned that this new test reactor that they're, they're already running, which is going to use this fuel. So that's definitely something that they're already doing, so, okay. Uh, the next question is, how is the NRC using information from the Department of Energy and its research in this area? So, interesting question here. So, the NRC is coordinating with DOE on research through the Gateway for Accelerated Innovation in Nuclear. Its acronym is called GAIN Initiative to investigate critically safety, criticality safety issues related to shipment of higher enriched uranium, right? Uranium hexafluoride, 
which is one form of Hayden. This research will evaluate the availability of critical experiments and use configurations similar to this. So in other words, right, uh, they are definitely sharing this information, they're working together, and uh, this is at least two of uh, maybe five agencies that are involved in this whole, pro pro uh, I'll call it a project or an initiative to bring nuclear energy uh, to the forefront of our, of our climate change initiative. So, uh, what is the next? Are there any are there medical uses for helium? And yes, that yes, medical isotope production. As we said earlier, medical isotope production facilities may use helium to produce isotopes to use to diagnose and treat certain diseases. That's already in the works and has been in the works for a while before we began using this as a fuel. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, HALU and International Partnerships, is the NRC working with international partners? And the answer is yes, the NRC is actively engaged with international partners. Uh, they are looking at the Transport Safety Standards Committee, the TRANS-C and the, at the IAEA, the NRC has been engaging with trans TransSec about any changes to international standards that may be necessary for transportation of advanced nuclear fuels, including HALU. So, so far, none have been identified. In addition, the NRC participates in various IA technical and consulting meetings. So in other words, they're out there uh, engaging. Uh, they're, they're looking for partnerships. They haven't had any yet. Uh, like what I was saying earlier, nuclear fuel up, up until recently was being sourced out of Russia in a lot of cases. So that presented a problem, as you can imagine. But in this case, um, yes, they have a number of different uh, agencies or different partnerships, international hopefully our allies that are going to be participating in this, in this particular initiative, because it's not just us as a nation, but it's, it, it's a whole group of allied nations that are really looking towards making a change when it comes to this technology and hopefully move forward, right? Uh, also the, um, the Nuclear Energy Agency, right? Uh, it's a committee on safety and nuclear isolations working as it has a working group, right? And they work on fuel cycle safety. So they are also engaged with that agency as well to make sure that they that the standards right that that we're are using are all consistent, especially if we intend to have a supply chain that's international, especially on this type of design and these SMRs that are hopefully be deployed out not just throughout the country but maybe in many different parts of the world. Um, that'll definitely and that'll definitely make a change when it comes to bringing accessibility to nuclear power or energy, and then of course that means really it's, it's producing clean clean, carbon-free energy to everybody out there. So, so again, uh, that is like a little brief uh, synopsis on, on what the NRC and the uh, Department of Energy has to say about HALU. And hopefully this uh, particular um, discussion was helpful. Um, if, by the way, I want to encourage you, if you have any comments, please, please, uh, please go ahead and write them below. If you like the video, please click like and subscribe. Uh, also, I will try and respond to comments in the videos. And I certainly look forward to answers. And if you have any experts out there that want to join uh, another episode and kind of like sh share some of the information and knowledge about this particular fuel and this particular technology for generating clean energy, I would definitely welcome that. And feel free to reach out so we can arrange that. Anyway, that, I think that is all the time we have for today. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining. And uh, I encourage you once again to uh, like and subscribe uh, and follow Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, for their multitude of great educational videos and great discussion on topics that affect not just energy, but also a whole wealth of other different areas in our, in our world, not just Hawaii, but the rest of the world. So thank you again. Have a great evening, and we'll talk again soon.